Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is 12 o'clock on a Sunday and it is time for a Q&A. This is where I take all the questions that you guys have asked over the course of the last week and I try and answer them to the best of my ability. So I'm super excited. There are some amazing questions that have been asked this week and please don't forget that we are now doing two Talk Magic interviews for the foreseeable future. We're doing Talk Magic interviews twice a week. So Friday, uh, Tuesday night at nine o'clock and Saturday night at nine nine o'clock. So yesterday, in case you missed it, we had an interview go up with the amazing Daniel Chard, one of the best card magicians you will ever see. So if you haven't seen that, go check out the playlist. But without further ado, let's have a look at some of the questions that I'm going to be answering this week. So question number one is by Sean McNulty. Hey, Sean, thank you very much for asking me some questions. Let's have a look at the first one. Right, apart from fiber optics, any other places to learn rope magic uh, or Professor's Nightmare? Well, you know what? I've got to say, fiber optics really is the DVD to learn rope magic. Now, a lot of people perform the fiber optics routine. Uh, however, uh, if you haven't seen Fiber Optics Extreme, that was a follow-on uh, a follow-on project by Richard Sanders, where he actually uh, tipped his ring and rope, which uses some of the Fiber Optics moves, uh, but he actually incorporates a ring in it as well. It's very similar to what David Williamson did with his ring and rope, but he's kind of taken it to a next level. It's kind of Williamson's ring on rope on steroids. And what I like so much about Fiber Optics is it's almost like a toolbox. Um, because th th he goes through so many different techniques and so many different ideas with ropes and you can just take which ones you want to and you can incorporate it into uh, into your performance. However, if you want to look elsewhere, um, Daryl had a set of three DVDs on rope magic from LNL Publishing. I think they're still available. And Murphys have just bought LNL, so I'm sure they'll be bringing them out along with the Legacy line. Uh, but he had some amazing stuff on that three DVD set. He had the um, he had a whole bunch of stuff with knots and a whole bunch of stuff, uh, loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of routines. Uh, very, very, very good, uh, very, very good DVD set to get because there's so much. There's literally so much. One of the first rope routines I ever learned was by Pat Page. He brought out a, a videotape. God, I'm talking old now. He brought out a videotape through Vic Pinto's Tricker Tape and he put a rope routine on. And it was like a multi-phase routine uh, which was all based around the classic cut and restored rope. And if you don't know the classic cut and restored rope, that is absolutely something that you should learn. Uh, it, it's where you take a normal rope, you apparently cut it into two, uh, and then it goes together into one. It's a really nice way to set up fiber optics with just one rope. So you can take one rope, you can apparently cut the rope, restore it, and you're into the same position that you are for fiber optics. Now, if you want to take that whole concept and take it to the next level, you want to have a look at Paul Green's In the Trenches. So uh, Paul Green is an amazing magician. He's gone under the radar of a lot of people, uh, but his In the Trenches DVD set is great. And it really is that. It's magic that's done in the trenches. And he has an awesome rope routine on there. But I showed Ryland a little while ago and Ryland's actually learning the rope routine. And it's incredible, it really is. There's so many different sequences to it. If you wanna just get inspired by rope magic, uh, you wanna have a look at Soma's Rope Act. Now, Soma uh, is the guy that won Fissum. He actually released a DVD on how to win at Fissum. Uh, and uh, he won with his uh, his payphone act. If you haven't seen that, it's amazing. You know, it's like a, a payphone and a, a miser's dream and oh, so many different things. But anyway, if you go on YouTube and you type in Soma's Rope Act, he's got a rope routine which is all done to music and the music changes as he performs it. He hasn't released that, but it's an amazing routine to watch, to get inspired from. Talking about Daryl, um, I perform his uh, acrobatic knot all of the time, which I think was originally Pavel's jumping knot uh, and Daryl kind of changed it around a bit and re-released it. Uh, whoever it is that did it, is it's an amazing routine, it really is. It's the idea is that you've got white rope and you've got red rope and you tie a knot in the white rope, it jumps off the white rope, it lands on the red rope and it becomes part of the red rope. It's really good. And uh, another routine that got released through the Legacy line, again by Daryl, um, is the Rainbow Ropes routine where you've got three ropes of different colours uh, and you tie them together so you've got one long rope and then you've got the knots here and all you do is you blow on the knots and they pop off and uh, and you're left with uh, with one long rope. Uh, Pavel is another person that you want to look at. You want to look at Pavel's. Uh, he's got a book on rope magic, and he's also got a 
uh, a DVD on Rope Magic as well. Uh, some of his stuff is absolutely amazing. Uh, Michael J. Fitch has got a really nice version of the uh, the walking knot. If you don't know what the walking knot is, it's a stage routine where you have a piece of rope. They hold uh, two spectators hold on to either end, and the idea is that you uh, you cut the rope somewhere, you tie a knot, and then you can move the knot to a different place of the rope. Open it up, move it to another place of the rope. Open it up. It's a beautiful routine. Uh, I think it's a Pavel routine, possibly. Correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, uh, I did that in my act for many, many years. And then I switched to Michael J. Fitch's routine because his uses just a regular rope. And he actually released that. It's probably through his site or something. You'll be able to find it somewhere. Um, yeah, that pretty much covers it. Oh, one more thing. If you want to see the funniest rope routine, it's not exactly PC. Uh, but if you want to see the funniest rope routine you'll ever see, go check out Michael Finney. Uh, Michael Finney's Rope Trick, uh, it's absolutely brilliant. It's a masterclass in how to perform on stage and just grab the audience's attention with nothing but a piece of rope. I kind of went on a bit about rope magic there, but I'm a big fan of rope magic, so hopefully some of those sources will help. Okay, so the next question is again by Sean McNulty. Uh, how are you able to learn so many routines, tricks and sets for close-up stage and remember all the routines and slides? I don't know, man. Uh, I get this question an awful lot and I think the answer is I'm just very, very passionate about magic and I'm very, very passionate about performing and I'm very, very passionate about learning new material. And I do, you know, I'm, I'm constantly reading. I'm constantly watching new routines. Obviously, I'm having to learn new stuff for the review show every single week. And then I'm researching older items for the some of, some of the stuff that I do on magic stuff. And I'm just like reading and, and learning for my own, my own benefit. I do try to keep things uh, as organized as possible. I've said on this channel before, I'm not a very organized person. So I do try and keep things uh, organized and I have kind of lists of the different routines that I do. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in different videos down the line. Uh, but I've just got a pretty good memory for this sort of stuff you know I just like the, the previous uh, question that you answered when I when I do a q and I don't I don't literally this is Sarah's phone she gives me her phone she screen captures all the questions and I just go through them I don't look at them beforehand just because I want to try and give you an off-the-cuff honest answer to any questions that are asked so the rope trick thing um, if I'd done some research into it I could probably think of a few more sources of rope tricks but everything I just cited for you was literally off the top of my head I think I've just got a really good memory um, I think one of the things that you want to do is you want to just make sure that you don't just learn a trick and then put it down. You want to actually perform the trick a few times, get it into kind of muscle memory, uh, get it into a position where you actually aren't going to forget it because we've all been there where we've spent ages learning a trick and then you've forgotten how that trick's done and you have to relearn it. But if you perform it a few times and uh, you don't just pay it lip, surf lip service, then you'll definitely remember it. Um, yeah, and I think it's just the case that I go and perform a lot. Even now, in the middle of a pandemic, I'm still going out and performing Zoom shows three or four times a day. I'm filming for this YouTube channel. So because I'm performing all of the time, I'm working this material and uh, it just it just gets lodged in the brain. Now, ask my wife, Sarah, and she'll tell you I am totally terrible about remembering anything else. I could not tell you my anniversary dates. I have no idea. I really struggle to remember my kids' uh, dates of birth, which is why it's built into a tattoo there. I'm terrible with remembering other stuff, but for some reason, I just remember how to do most tricks. Okay, so the next question is again by Sean McNulty. Um, you are the man for asking all these questions. Uh, your thoughts on socially distanced magic at weddings? How long should you do it? What tricks should you do? Uh, best time? What tricks do you mainly do for it and best times? Um, well, you know what? I think that uh, at the moment in the UK, at any rate, we're in a complete lockdown. We can't perform anywhere other than virtually. Um, and, and, and prior to that, over, you know, we had another lockdown in November. So we only really had one month of not lockdown. And in that month, there was a tier system that made it very, very difficult to go out and do much. Um, before that, in the summer, uh, I was doing quite a lot of socially distant shows and I'd actually developed a series of tricks that were designed to work socially distanced. And I'm actually going to go through those in future videos because I think that magicians should be in a position where they've got a whole bunch of magic that they can do in a socially distanced environment uh, ready for when the entire world opens up in 2021, which I think it will. Um, and there's also tricks that I think that we aren't going to be able to do, at least for a long while. Uh, and I'm going to do a video on that probably in the next week or two. I'm going to highlight tricks that I really don't think the magicians 
precautions should be doing until everything is completely back to normal. Because I think what's going to happen is as the pandemic lifts and as more people uh, feel more confident with going out and gathering in crowds, things will get better and better and better. But at least initially, I think people are going to be nervous. They're going to be quite wary about uh, about about you know, uh, socially distanced things. So I think that at least initially you, you need to have uh, socially distanced magic that you can do. Um, and really, you know, uh, some of the gigs that I've done, and I've spoken to Gary Jones about this, and I know he, he said exactly the same thing. Uh, some of the gigs that I've done, they, um, you know, the, the, the socially distanced has just gone out the window. I've gone there with a mask. I've gone there with my whole bunch of sets. And people are just there. Massive, like, garden parties with 30 people. Uh, and, and everybody's just, like, really close to each other. And there's no social... There is no social distancing at all. Um, and I think you need to kind of take it on a on a gig-by-gig -gig basis. Uh, and I think you need to kind of read the crowd a little bit, uh, to be perfectly honest. But stuff that's going to happen in the spectator's hand, I think you need to stay away from that, at least initially, until things get a little bit more back to normal. Uh, so it, it's, easy, it's an easy switch. Instead of doing coins across into the spectator's hand, you do coins across into your hand. It's still just as impressive. Uh, instead of having somebody sign a card, you sign a card for them. What's your name? Jane. Okay, I'm going to put Jane on this card for you. Is that fair? Fantastic. No problem. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, but then you can incorporate props into your socially distanced magic as well so one idea that i want to share with you a bit later is the idea of having a wild coin routine get yourself some really dirty coins um you know get, whatever they may be doesn't matter which coins but get yourself some really dirty coins and get yourself a um uh, some metal polish and just polish one side of the dirty coin. And what you have there is you have a perfect copper silver coin where one side of the coin is completely clean and the other side of the coin is completely dirty, right? And, and what you can do now is you can do a really nice uh, wild coin style routine using that as the gimmick. So you can have like three coins that are like filthy and you can show them and you can say, oh, the problem is I don't really want to perform with these because these are nasty, which is why I've got this. Bring yourself a little pocket, a, a little packet, a little uh, hand sanitizer out. Take the first coin, show it, and you've switched it for the, uh, the, the copper silver that you've made. Take the hand sanitizer, spray, and when you spray, it turns into a nice shiny coin. Put it in a glass, do the next one, do the next one, do the next one, and each one you time, you spray it, and it turns really shiny as if it's brand new. Then you put it inside the thing, and then you finish off, and you tip them all out, and you say, of course, you've got to keep sanitizing, and if you don't, you know, there's so many different things that you can do. You can, you can incorporate hand sanitizer, you can incorporate all of this stuff, into your performance but i think if you're a little bit nervous make sure you've got hand sanitizer with you make sure that people are seeing that you're sanitizing the hands regularly uh, you can even put a hand sanitizer on a pole right and you could make a big deal of sanitizing your hands and then go and having it disappear there's so much stuff you can do uh, but don't really go too far into it you know the fact is a lot of the material that you do at the moment will work there's certain routines that won't work and over the coming few weeks and months i'm going to be doing more videos about this but um that's kind of going to whet your appetite Hope that I hope that helped, Sean. Sean's got one final question, so another question by Sean McNulty. I'm going to do more Zoom shows. Very good, you should. When doing a show, how can you record shows for future marketing? Well, if you have a paid Zoom account, and you really should have a paid show, uh, uh, a Zoom account, Sean, uh, what you can do is you can set the video um, to um, you can set the you can set the, the whole Zoom thing up to record either speaker view, gallery view or both. And you can just set that to, uh, to uh, record automatically in the settings when you set up the, uh, the, the call, uh, or you can actually do it as the host uh, in the actual platform. You can set it up one of two ways. You can either set it up in the cloud, or you can set it up on the actual desktop you're using. So um, we always record them in the cloud, and then we can choose whether to download them or not. Um, and I'm guessing, you know, future marketing, you're talking about having some shows so you can put a show reel together. Um, if you are doing a show and you're recording the speaker view and it's just you on the speaker view and you're not spotlighting other people as part of your show, then that's absolutely fine. You know, you can just do that. That's not a problem. You can just literally record speaker view and you can use that footage. And when we did our first virtual party show reel, that's what we did. We just took a load of virtual party speaker view footage and we just put it all together into a show reel. Um, if you're going to start using the gallery view, which is where you can see everybody, really you're going to need consent 
from the client. So you're gonna to need to say, look, you know, I wanna put myself a new showreel together, I wanna to use it for marketing. Is that okay if I use the gallery view and I can record the reactions of some of the people that are at this event? And if they're okay with it and you get permission from them and their guests, then that's cool, no problem, absolutely fine. Uh, but it's a very easy thing to film, um, very easy to just set as record and then you can just download it directly from Zoom onto your whatever device that you're going to edit it on, which is what I do with the Talk Magic interviews. When I'm doing the Talk Magic interviews, I'm doing them over Zoom. I record both gallery and speaker. When I'm editing, I'm just bringing the two clips together and I'm switching between gallery and speaker uh, in order to edit that whole video together, right? So it's basically a very similar concept, but you just want to make sure that if you've actually got people that are going to be in that footage from the gallery view, you just want to make sure that you got their permission. There you go, I hope that helps. Okay, so Mr. Harmon is back. Hey, Mr. Harmon, I hope you are well. Um, so Mr. Harmon's got a question here. Do you have any knowledge on why Murphy's Magic decided to stop the at-the-table lectures? No, I don't really know the guy. Well, I do. I know the guys at Murphy's. I know um, Titanus really well, and I know uh, a couple of the girls in the office. And back in the day, I, I, I had a tour. Tim Trono took me around. Murphy's Warehouse, which was just phenomenal. It was when I was in San Francisco and I went down with Sarah to Sacramento and Murphy's put me up in a hotel and, and then I got the guided tour around the warehouse and I did some magic for everyone at the team. It was really nice. Um, the good guys there. Um, but I don't know why they stopped the at-the-table lectures. I have no idea. If I was going to guess, I would say that it's because Penguin are doing it a lot better, um, you know, which they are. You know, the, the, the live acts are just a lot better in my opinion. And there's so many different options now, you know, uh, Alec Azam are doing the uh, Alec Azam Academies, which are really good. And uh, Vanishing Inc are doing the masterclasses, which again are really good. And Penguin are doing the Penguin Lives, which are brilliant. And I think those three companies have got it nailed. And I think the problem is, uh, if you look at the three companies that are doing this stuff at the moment, they've all got different artists. So Alec Azam are having a lot of people that are like big in the UK. So J John Carey's done quite a few um, of the academies. Steve Deller's done quite a few of the academies. Then you've got uh, Penguin. They get so many big names in. But but if you look at the masterclasses by Vanishing Inc., they're doing like different names. They've got like Guy Hollingsworth. Uh, you know, Dave Williamson and people like that that you don't see. So they've all got their own kind of niche. And I think that um, uh, when uh, At The Table were being done, <coughs> I think it was just the same people. And it was kind of a case of, well, you know, I've got... I, I've got this subscription to Penguin. Why would I want it? And I've, I've watched this guy do two Penguin acts. Why would I want to watch him do it at the table? Um, why would I want to do that? Now, some people have made an effort to actually make sure it's completely different, like Matt Baker did. Um, I, 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 because at the end of the day, right, okay, if you really want to know why Murphy's stopped the at-the-table thing, the bottom line is Murphy's are a business, right? That, that's, a, that's going without saying. They don't release magic for the fun of it. They want to, they are running a business and therefore they want their business to be profitable. And when you run a business, what you have to do is on a very regular basis, you look at your business, you look at what's profitable, you look at what's not profitable. And, and then what you do is if there's something that's not profitable, you say to yourself, well, can I make it profitable? And if I can't make it profitable, we cut it. Uh, and, and the fact is, they've got rid of their at the tables. Now, there's only really two reasons for that. The first reason is they've decided to rebrand it and they're going to launch it as something else, um, which I don't think is the case because they got rid of it a, a little while ago and have not done anything else about, about that. Well, the other option is it wasn't really profitable. It wasn't really making much money. And if it's not really making much money... Uh, then you're going to get rid of it. As a business, they're going to get rid of it. And maybe it was just treading on the toes of the other stuff that Peng P Murphy's do. Because a lot of the stuff that Murphy's do, they're buying a product, they wholesale it out. It's a very easy thing for them to do. Yeah, yeah, we'll have we'll have a thousand of those. Look, who wants this? And everybody carries Murphy's stuff. Whilst with the at-the-tables, they have to have somebody film it. They're constantly having to do them every single month. Maybe it was more effort for less money. I think that's probably why it is, because the bottom line is, as a business, if the at-the-tables were massively popular, they wouldn't get rid of it. If they were making an absolute fortune, they wouldn't get rid of it. Um, so maybe when you take the costs of producing it, the costs of paying the artists versus the money they got in from doing it, 
maybe it was just a loss or it was just breaking even and they thought, well, there's no point. Uh, especially when you consider that there's another bunch of people like Alakazam and Penguin and Vanishing Inc. that are doing it as good, if not better, than what Murphy's were doing. I think that's probably the reason. So the next question again is by Mr. Harmon. Where can I find a really good solved Rubik's Cube shell at an affordable price? Uh, well, you know what? <laughs> I haven't seen... There's lots of Rubik's Cube shells on the market, Mr. Harmon, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to get a really good Rubik's Cube shell, you have to go with either Rubik's Dream or Rubik's Dream 360 because they are the absolute best quality. They really are. There is no better shell than Rubik's 360. Henry Harrius, bless his cotton socks, he produces the most amazing Rubik's Cube gimmicks. And yeah, and the nice thing about Henry's stuff is it all combines together. So the vending cube will fit in the shells from Rubik's 360. You get an Insta cube and it'll, it'll work with a Venom cube. You know, it, it's, it all just marries together really, really nicely. So I, I would say to you, get, get, get Henry's shell. Um, I would advocate getting a normal Rubik's Dream over a Rubik's Dream 360. Ryland would disagree with me because Ryland doesn't use the Rubik's Dream, he uses the Rubik's Dream 360. But Ryland generally, as a rule, performs on stage, he doesn't do that much close-up. And so for him, um, you know, he's got his routine with his Rubik's 360 and it's not an issue for him, but you wouldn't want to do that close-up. For me, if I'm doing close-up, I love the Rubik's 360 and I especially love the little shell that comes with it. Because what I tend to do is, uh, and I'll tell you right now, I, uh, I, I have the little shell, I put the little cube, uh, I have that in my pocket, the little cube with the shell on it, uh, in my pocket, I take another cube out and uh, I, I do a timing force, which I've talked about on 5x5 five five, and I get them to say stop. I, get, I put that down there, I then take the cube out, I palm off the shell, I give them the cube, they mix it up, I put the shell back on, it's an absolute perfect mix, uh, it matches exactly, and, and I can then just put the shell away, um, I'm reset ready for the next table, and I can pick this cube up and do a one second solve, whatever I want to do, so, and, and the quality is absolutely amazing, so I would get a Rubik's 360, it's a little bit more money, but my gosh, it's really important when you're using cube magic, that, that the quality is there, that's really, really important, and you want to make sure that all the cubes match up, uh, which is another reason to use Henry's products. Might not be the answer you were looking for, but, uh, you know, I'm being honest with you. I'd get them. Okay, so the next question is by Danny Marco. I love this question. When Sarah was reading, <laughs> when re Sarah gave me these questions and she read it to me, I was like, oh, that's really funny. And the question is, who's your favourite magician and why is it Paul Harris? God, well, you know, Paul is an amazing magician. He really is. Uh, Paul rocks and, you know, Super Magic was one of the very first books that I learned coin magic from. Uh, back in the day, uh, Super Magic is great. Uh, everything Paul's done is absolutely wonderful. You don't see that much from the Paul Harris present stuff anymore. Uh, you don't see Paul Harris that much these days. Uh, but if he never releases another product again, if we never hear from Paul Harris again, his legacy has absolutely set. And I'll, I'll let you know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, my goal, when one of my goals when setting up this channel, and especially when doing the, um, doing the talk magics, was to get an interview with Paul Harris. If I can get an interview with Paul Harris, my God, I'll be happy. So yeah, he's an amazing magician. Is he my favourite magician? No. But he's right up there. I've got to say, uh, a lot of people know this. My favourite magician is Rune Klan, maybe Scott Alexander. Those two are absolutely brilliant. I love them both. Uh, but, you, you know, I've got a lot of magicians that I like. I have a very eclectic taste in magicians. But, um, but yeah, Paul Harris is amazing. Okay, so the next question is by the Queen of Magic, Tiffany, and she asks, uh, what can we do to get more women into magic? And you know, one thing that I want to do is I want to start uh, interviewing more women on the channel. There are some amazing female magicians. And if you guys don't know, uh, before I started this channel in 2019, I helped Tiffany uh, with her uh, 365 challenge. Tiffany did a, a 365 challenge where she, she performed a trick every single day for a whole year. And uh, I filmed all of that stuff for her and I put it up onto her YouTube channel. And, you know, I think it's an incredible thing to be able to do. Uh, be able to perform 365 individual tricks. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and, and I think there's some amazing female magicians out there. I'm a big fan of Jazz Vegas. I'm a big fan of Laura London. There's so many uh, 
uh, uh, magicians that I'm a big fan of. And I want to highlight to you uh, a, an amazing YouTube channel. Okay, this is a brilliant YouTube channel. And if you are not on this YouTube channel, you really should go and subscribe. And it's called Magical Women with Connie Boyd. Now, Connie Boyd is a Las Vegas magician and illusionist. She is exceptional. And she's created this YouTube channel where every single week she interviews a woman in magic. Uh, and I'm just looking at some of the stuff. Uh, you know, it's it, the, the, some of the, the stuff that she's got going up on her YouTube channel is absolutely amazing. You should go check out Connie Boyd's channel because she has got women. She's on a mission to get more people uh, to find out about women and magic and, and promote women in magic. And I think it's an amazing thing to do. And, uh, you know, I want to speak to Connie because I think we could do some sort of collab. I really do. I really would like more people to know about Connie and what she's doing. And guys, let me know down below. If you know if, uh, a woman in magic, I would love to interview them for the channel. I really would, especially now we're doing two interview slots a week. Um, I would love to interview them. I really would. So let me know down below who your favorite female magician is so I can approach them for an interview. Because they, you're right, you know, this isn't the 1960s. This isn't the 1970s or the 1980s. Women are just as good, if not better, at magic than men. That's just a fact. So let's get more women interviewed on the channel. And uh, let me know down below who your favorite female magician is. Okay, so the final question today is from pretty much everybody. I've had a lot of people ask this question. And, uh, and the question is, am I ever going to release any more magic? And it's a good question. I haven't released magic for a long time. I've carried on creating. I've carried on, um, um, you know, like performing. And um, I've got hundreds of tricks uh, that I think are amazing that I could release. And um, uh, I kind of got put off the um the the releasing magic thing after red which still gets brought up from time to time as you know even though i've been completely honest and candid about it and i've even done an honest trailer on it i still get uh people throwing it in my face from time to time <coughs> that put me off ever ever releasing magic again because it was kind of like well do i do i really want to go down this route and i've kind of decided if i can actually team up with a uh, with a with a with a, a, a magic producer or a magic dealer who I trust that's very knowledgeable and uh, and they can look at something that I'm releasing and they can make sure that it's 100% uh, my own because I'm very knowledgeable but as you as yeah, you know as 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 I know from only too well from personal experience, um, it, things can slip through the net big style, okay? So you need, when you're creating magic, you need other people to look at it as well. Um, and I don't just want to release anything. I don't just want to release crap. If I release another product again, um, it's going to be something that's going to be absolutely awesome. It's going to be something that I perform, that I believe in. It's not going to be something that I just release for releasing sake because I want to release a product because I don't need to do that anymore. I really don't. Um, you know, I do the YouTube channel for fun and I think it'd be very hypocritical if I was releasing a crap trick. Now, does that mean I'm going to release a trick that everybody's going to love? Maybe not. But at least if I believe in it, if I believe in it as a trick, then then from my point of view, um, I'm happy. So uh, I'll tell you right now, I am talking with a couple of magic producers. I'm talking with a couple of magic dealers. I'm talking with uh, with um, Alakazam. Because uh, I have massive respect for Alakazam. I'm also talking to Penguin Magic um, uh, uh, about 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 maybe doing some stuff with both of them. Um, and also, if you go onto MagicTV.org, www.MagicTV.org, you'll see that uh, in 2021 I'm going to be releasing something called the Netrix, uh, which is very very different to anything that you've seen before. And uh, I know a lot of people have messaged me saying, "Well, what's this all about?" And whatever you think it is. It's very, very different, which is why it's not going to be released uh, for a few months. But when it does, uh, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. So, yeah, yeah, I'm going to dip my toe back into the uh, into the magic creating and producing world. And there are going to be some things that are going to be coming out from me in the coming weeks and months and years. And I'm sure I'll tell you about that. What I'm going to do about reviewing them, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I will be able to review them. Maybe I'll just perform them to you and say, hey, this is available. And maybe one of the other amazing review channels uh, will review it for me if, if and when I uh, I bring something out. So yeah, um, the answer is yes. Uh, at some point, uh, it's 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 on my priority list. It's not the top priority, but it's up there. And uh, I'll let you guys know when anything else happens. 
So there you go, that's another Q&A. Thank you very much once again for subscribing to the channel and, uh, and, and following everything that we do. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so. Like the video, leave a comment down below. All of that stuff is very, very important. And uh, I'm going to be back tomorrow with a 5x5. Five five. So I'm going to be back tomorrow with a 5x5. With a, with a five five. And I think, is it the one tomorrow? Yes, I think it is. The, if, if I'm right... The 5x5 five five I've got tomorrow is a Jay Sankey special. It's either going out this Monday or the following Monday. I can't remember which one, but I'm 99% sure that this Monday is a Jay Sankey 5x5 five five special, because I love Jay Sankey. Uh, I'm gonna be talking, if it is the one, I filmed it a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to be talking about the five best Sankey tricks that he's ever released. And the five worst Sankey tricks that he's ever released, because let's be honest, Jay Sankey has released some crap, but he's also released some amazing routines as well. So look out for that. It's either this Monday or next Monday. I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow. And uh, I'll see you again soon. Thanks very much for watching. And my name's Craig from Magic TV.